It has been over 150 years since the first European traders arrived on the magnificent coastline of Vancouver Island on Canada's west coast. A world once rich with indigenous culture now falters at the edge of existence. A land that was ruled by the great Thunderbird, deep-rooted spirituality and Aboriginal traditions that have been passed on since the beginning of creation. A native home that now only whispers the stories of the past. Stories, legends, wisdom, strength that are desperately feared of being lost forever. The hardships facing many Aboriginal youth living on reserves have perpetuated through the generations. Since the forced removal from ancestral lands, the youth of today continue to face the same problem as the elders did before them in confronting the challenge of learning to walk in two worlds, one of their own people, one of the dominant society. But the silent voices of the past continue to echo throughout this region, voices that only now are finally beginning to reclaim that which is their own, so that the Aboriginal youth of today are better prepared to walk in the world of tomorrow. In our contact with traditionally trained elders uh, in, in our own language, uh, they are referred to as Siem Nasalquin, Sol Elo. These are individuals who have, who have worked within our own institutions. They are the ones who are trained, generally speaking, as children by their parents and grandparents. And the basis for that training takes the shape of, of uh, being able to understand why it's important to be quiet, why it's important to listen, the importance of family, the importance of sharing, the importance of knowing uh, when to keep quiet, uh, the importance of knowing that, it, that uh, not only is the individual family to be strengthened, but also the extended family, and the importance of children learning that they are loved and significant but also knowing the importance of being strong. We always say we're not going to be here forever. So we would like for the children to learn it now while there are still elders that they can talk to, that they can listen to. And one of the things that I really feel is important is to know about themselves, their family history. the traditions of their families. I say this because a lot of children are growing up not knowing the history of their grandparents, the strengths that they had, the strengths that they passed on to the parents. The parents aren't sharing it with their, their children. So we, as elders, are trying to fill that gap and pass, share with them what we know, what we've been taught. I think it's, it's, it's crucial. I'm now 74 years old, going on 75. And for what little time that I have left, I have to share and leave that behind as a legacy for my children and um, other people's children. And in my generation, I think we are the last that could provide some of that uh, information, the teachings. So it is important to, to all of us not just to me, but to the young ones, uh, the new ones that are unborn yet, they have to have some understanding of the tra traditional ways that we have. I, I was born, you see where that green little thing is there? Yeah. It was a longhouse, my grandfather's. There was two longhouses this way. And that two of my grandfather's. Uh, had longhouse, and I was born in one of those in 1925. And people still lived in longhouses when I was born. And there was just across, there was another longhouse. And on just on this side of that platform, there were four longhouses that were side by side up along that hill. 
And across the, the ditch there, there was another, the biggest longhouse was the late Tommy Paul. And just next to that was the Morrises. They had a, a small little longhouse for the family. And, you know, during the time when, when the new dances, the grab new dances, pretty near in every house. And whenever one of them hollered, they'd run them to the next longhouse and circle around. And if there were new dances in that house, they'd follow. And then they moved to the next longhouse, and then they run around there too. And by the time they end off back into where it started, all the new dances would be in that, in that one house. And they used to do that all the time. And most of the, the things that we've learned or I've learned as a young person is from those long houses, from uncles, you know, grandparents. And I guess that's why we kind of want to bring this back to you young people. Another to me is someone that talks to younger ones, teaches a lot to youth. I guess you can say that's a definition of elders to me. Elder to me would be someone loving and caring, understanding towards me, someone that could help me, someone that knows a lot. I don't know, all I know is that somebody that's like older than you know, like have more experience with everything. Well, an elder is like somebody really old, you know, it's related, you know, grandma or something far distance. An uh, elder is uh, someone who knows a lot of heritage about what happened in the past and someone who's respected a lot. Um, someone that I could come to um, if I need anything, um, especially um, having to do with my culture and language. They're not trying to get like mad at you, they're just like helping you like go up the way they did. So in other words, they're like teaching you how they, what they got taught. I uh, like them and I uh, really want to learn a lot of teachings from them about our culture and our native language. Yeah, some elders do pass things on, like really sacred stuff and all that. I see an elder as someone who has, that everyone respects and looks up to all the time and um, the way I see the way they work is and they're around to help us and be there for us more than we think and um, they, they do a lot more for us than we think too. Yeah. And it's it's good that they they're willing to spend time with us and pass down the traditional teachings and um, teach us about our cultures and the native language and stuff like that. <laughs> Oh, people used to talk about how the first person was, was dropped here in Gold Stream. And he lived here and he watched all the little animals and all the little birds had mates, you know. And he started to realize that he didn't have a mate. And he decided that he was going to mold a, a young lady out of rotten, all the rotten wood that comes from a tree, it gets really powdery. So he laid it down, he started to shape it out. In the meantime, there were two young girls out in Suk. 
and some of you might be, might be part of your ancestry. And they, they all used to climb the mountains way up there and they seen a wisp of smoke coming out of here. And they decided we must go and see what that smoke or where it's coming from. The, I don't know how many days that they come over the mountains and followed. The, they landed up here or up there, one of the mountains here, and they looked down and they could see this man had a fire going and they came, it was dusk when they come closer to where his camp was. And he watched this, this man, he was shaping a, a model. And he felt that he could uh, make his mate out of earth. And these two young ladies were watching and they decided that one of them would take the place of that that girl that he was molding and the argument started. They started to argue of who is going to take that place to be that man's mate. And I guess that's why we today we still argue when we have a mate or when we have brothers or sisters, there's arguments. And I just mentioned that even in the, in the scripture that the Europeans brought over. Uh, they talk about Adam and Eve and the serpent. But it's similar to, to those teachings. But I think that's what uh, we need to be proud of, that we are the first people here. You come from all of those first people. I guess that's why, you know, every one of you young people are related to us people here, the older people. That's one of the things that that the song he is still hold, they don't show it nowhere. And that came with creation. Why he came with creation. Each reservation, each um, community has their own teachings from their elders, and I try to look at each each one of them and, and learn something from them. Native people gathering makes us stronger as a native race. As far as we are apart, you know, relatives all over, we could still be one if all of us knew our traditional ways and teachings. I think my opinion anyways. We have to start taking a more active role in the um, development of the curriculum that our young people will have to, to learn and hopefully that from there we'll have a better success rate in terms of graduates and young people who will go on to a college and university. The challenge for the young people, I think, is that they, they're getting into trouble because there's a vacuum. And I think it, if we look back on some of the things that have been imposed upon us and that impact us, and I think the big one is the residential school. And what happened is when the kids were taken from, our children were taken from our communities, they didn't have that connection anymore and they lost, they weren't getting the teachings from our elders. So it's created a vacuum, and I, I see that vacuum is still there. And one of the ways to address it is to bring our elders back in and start uh, having them interact with the elders so they can start passing that knowledge they have to the, to the youth. Our elders are, are very, um, I guess there are keepers of our knowledge, and they they have everything in in their in their head, and nothing is written yet. So it's important that we do get them to start teaching our young people, so that that knowledge is passed down. I 
It was a teaching of our old people that when you feel that you're under a lot of stress, be it through your job, in your home, you go, go up into the woods and you look for a, thick, a thicket and you walk through that thicket. And as you're walking through it, you're going to be asking it to take everything away from you, all that's troubling you, the stress frustrations, whatever, take it away from me. And once you get through that thicket, you're going to feel just as light as can be. Because this is what we were given, a place to find that comfort, a place to find the answers to whatever problems we may have. I think that's what one of the elders had uh, always mentioned that you have a right because you're Siem Mustimuch. Siem Mustimuch is, I guess the only way you can describe Siem Mustimuch is you're a rich person. <laughs> you have all these rights as you grow, but it's going to be up to you. It's going to be up to you to take those and develop it. He said, you can't just stand there and let the years pass by. Because, you know, if you have these rights, then you have to take, participate in those things that had belonged to you. It's like the share. When I started paddling in 1958, I was in residential school. Thirteen years old when I started. I lied about my age just to get involved. I'm supposed to be 14. Guess I'm a good liar. I had to go to confession too, so. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we started about around April. Training. The diet is, is really the thing about getting in condition. A lot of coaching. And when you get on the canoe, you gotta get on with good feelings like everything else. I spell it, really good feeling. To be successful. No one is to get on this canoe with bad feelings. You gotta treat that canoe, respect that canoe. So hoping the the youth here will really listen and really take it to to heart and open their ears and their heart to to keep our culture going. starting to fade away, but we, it's up to you as youth to, to try to bring our canoeing back. And it comes from the heart. It comes from the heart. It's really good medicine for me to be here to share. Thank you. Sometimes words can go over anybody's head, uh, but uh, sometimes an image will make an lasting impression on you. And um, of course in our culture we're always carving birds and animals and fish and moons and suns and different types of masks and that's because that's our culture is, is, is all those things. Our spiritual guidance, our spiritual helpers, our spiritual connection to this world is animals and birds and things of nature. I believe that the, the um, discipline of carving in artwork is as important as our history and in our language. Um, it's been said by people that a picture is worth like over a thousand words and um, that would go for the kind of images that we create, like whether they're bowls or salt, salt, and spindle whirls. 
or a totem pole there, and um, they're, they're very important because they help us record our history, they take part in our history, and we have our own design system, and our design system is very important to us. It um, goes along with our language. It's as different as our language is from other people's languages in other areas, and their artwork is different from ours, but at the same time similar. And um, <clears throat> there, was, there was a time in our past, not too distant past, when the whole art system of the Salish people just about vanished. And um, I came along at a time when I couldn't find any of it. I used to, um, I was a carver since I was a kid, and I tried carving, and then when I got old enough to see masks and things, I started trying to carve them. But uh, I met other people who started saying to me, you know, the Salish got a really beautiful system. Why don't you do something about it? Why don't you try to revive it? So it became an obsession with me to revive it and uh, pass it on. I know some, some of our people they're, they, they're embarrassed because they're natives. I always get told by one person that they were wish they were a different race, but I wish they would just let it in their hearts that they're native. Just let it in, accept it. I see a lot of people saying, oh yeah, all these white people look down at us and they're really um, or other non-natives are looking down to us and hacking us or whatever because we're native or because of, you know, the non-tax thing. Um, but I notice that it's not just the white, the non-natives that are racist towards us. It's our own people that are racist towards non-natives. And that's a big thing that concerns me because, like I said last night, a lot of my friends, um, my native friends, I don't know, just have this look in their eye towards non-natives that they have learned from their parents and their grandparents. If the you know, elders weren't around to pass down the traditions and stuff, you know, so we could pass it on to our children. And if they didn't do that, I think all us young people would be lost and confused and stuff like that. I think sweat uh, for some people was just uh, kind of a cleansing. But we offered this for a real healing, very sacred healing. We do four rounds in the sweat lodge. We share with the young people exactly what one round symbolizes. And it's not just going in there like um, one of those uh, saunas or whatever. There's a purpose. It's really teaching the children that through heat we can heal. And regardless of how intense the heat, if we are following the rules of that sweat lodge, we don't feel the heat, we feel the good cleansing that is happening to us and it's the cleansing of the body our physical and it's the cleansing of our mind so that we don't carry those bad things anymore and it's the nurturing of our spirit so that we can be strong 
spiritually. Yeah. I feel like his brother. To me, the longhouse is a very, very important part of our lives. It's a place of healing, spiritual healing. It's a place of learning. When we put someone in the longhouse, we tell them we're giving them a second chance in life. Some young people might think that Longhouse is just about singing and dancing. But that's not the way I look at it. It's our whole culture. It's our life. I'd rather see them keep playing the whole summer or in the longhouse all winter or whatever rather than you know, out in the streets messing their 
body and minds up and stuff. Like my people, they're, 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 they've practically lost their culture because of drugs and alcohol. But I'm still into it because I don't want to be grown up not long, not learning where I'm from. And I want to learn. It's, it's pretty strong. There's a lot of adults that can teach you a lot of things. Like my grandma, she has taught me a lot of stuff in the big house. She's like one of the persons that you can look up to if you want to know something in any kind of culture. Cause she's really good at that stuff. <laughs> she's been through all that stuff that we've still never been through yet. We learn how to speak within the longhouse. It takes many years to learn to have that discipline because the elders say that us young people have sharp tongues. We have to be careful what we say so that we don't hurt people. We have to become mature and learn the teachings before we begin to, to speak. But I do know these days that we have come to a time where the young people have to be heard. The young people have to be heard of the, th the things that they see within this life, the things they feel that are wrong. Because one day we're going to be the ones who are going to be leading this area. We have to live in two different worlds. And sometimes that is the struggle for us. Because our culture comes first. We have to learn our ways first. Once again, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for starting out with us this morning and you're still with us. That is really good. Makes us feel like what we're here to offer you, you're willing to accept. You're willing to learn the teachings that we are sharing with you. And I hope that each and every one of you will take something home from this what have we've done today, even if it's one small thing, that's going to mean a lot. You can build on it. Maybe you think, well, I don't know what they meant by that, but one day it's all going to come together for you. You're going to understand what we're trying to tell you. And I hope continue to pay attention the way you have been today. It's good to see you all sit and listen. That is really good. Always carry yourselves like that. That way the elders will be so willing to let you to share with you the teachings that are going to help you. Because one day to come, you are the ones that are going to be the teaching the young ones. I want to thank you for sticking with it, because I know it was hard for you guys today. And I really want to thank you for being there. Sometimes we wanted to just say, no, there's too many bad things happening. We can't do it, you know. We don't want to do it. But we all stuck together and made it happen. And it's because of you, the youth, myself, the elders, we all did it together. And every one of you that's sitting around here made it work today. And you're all important to us. That's why we're here tonight. So when you need help doing something, 
Just don't think that, oh, it's too hard. No, I'm not going to do it because it wouldn't work. The easiest thing to do is give up when you're trying to accomplish something. And if you need help, ask for help. That's why we're here. I have really learned a lot today. Uh, just learning about what happened everywhere, and how you guys lived, and just feel like I went back in time and just, you know, shared it with you. Feels good to get something from people. Thank you. And I really never knew anybody that would take time out of their jobs or life or whatever to help us. And I heard about the workshop and, and then slowly I got into it and into it and then everybody started helping us. And I really learned a lot and I really liked spending time with you guys today. It was lots of fun walking around and listening to stories and legends and stuff. I just wanted to thank you guys for um, handing down your the teachings that you guys know. And I just go. What is fundamentally important to young people 
is that when they, when they apply the teachings and the rules and regulations, particularly in terms of being in balance, and continue working with indigenous training in the, the old people who lived on this land, then it's easier for them to access the energy of the land, the energy of the ancestors, the energy of the natural and supernatural world. One has to remember, I mean, we've got to remember that in 1854, Chief Seattle said, there is no death, only a change of worlds.